I was just wondering if you would uh, elaborate on uh, the book of Enoch talks about the the spirits of the pre pre flood giants. Also, uh, Isaiah twenty six fourteen alludes to the uh, Raphim that they will not rise. Uh, what is your take on the I guess the theory that the spirits of the pre flood giants became the demons of the New Testament? Yeah, they're, they're, if you're not familiar with um, Second Temple angelology and demonology. In books like Enoch and Jubilees and, and you know, other sources too, the Bible itself, again, what we look at as the, the canonical Bible, does not ever give us an explanation for where demons come from. In fact, demons are only mentioned twice in the whole Old Testament. The New Testament, you know, it, it becomes more of, a, of an item. But we're, we're never really told where they, they come from. Now, in the literature between the Testaments, there's a lot of discussion on that, and Enoch is sort of the primary example. Where demons come from in, in Jewish theology, so like if you read the Encyclopedia of Judaism or something like that, you're going you're gonna to see this. In, in ancient Jewish theology, where demons come from is when the sons of God cohabit with the human women, they produce Nephilim, and, and the giants you know, just go crazy, and they start killing people and cannibalizing and all this kind of stuff. It's just, it's just really bad. So God says we need to wipe them out. And when you killed one, the immaterial part of that Nephilim being, the spirit part, became a demon. And they were sort of sentenced to be disembodied and roam all over the earth, and, and they were allowed to do that. A certain number of them were allowed to do that and you know, harass people. And this is standard Jewish theology. You don't actually ever see that taught in the Old or New Testament there are certain things that would, would sort of go with it. In other words, would cohere with the idea. For instance, some of the episodes in the Gospels about the, the demons possessing people. Some scholars think that the whole idea of possession harkens back to this idea that demons seek re-embodiment. And you have... You have certain turns of phrases in the New Testament describing what demons do and the strong man. And, you know, it's just, again, they're, they're just phrases. They're just illusions. But you can find similar language, very, very similar language in books like Enoch when they're discussing this thing. So the question is, is this a direct allusion back to that? Should we import this theology into this? And Again, I, I, I'm, I personally am not really decided on that. I would... I would like to see more textual connections before I draw that conclusion. But I'll, I'll admit that there, there are some things about what the New Testament says about demons that would make sense in that context. I just don't know. Well, I, I, I can tell you I do know that I can't say the New Testament teaches that. But again, some of what it does teach would fit in that framework. And that, that's really all we have. I mean, it, it's evident from other places, again, Peter and Jude, that they are... They're, what, they're, what they're articulating about their own angelology is informed by Enoch. There, there's no doubt about that. The, the classic example is in Second Peter 2, uh, where, well, Peter twice talks about the angels that sinned. Well, there is no angelic sin in the Old Testament except for Genesis 6, okay? And it mentions that they were put in chains and cast into darkness. And one passage has them in Tartarus, Okay, well, the, the whole idea of being cast in cha chains and put in darkness, that is not in the Old Testament. That's not in Genesis 6. Where it is, is books like Enoch. So you actually have content elements from that book that are, that are put into the New Testament that become part of Peter or Jude's articulation of their demonology. And Tartarus is the place where the offending titans, again, depending on where you're at in, in the history of Greek mythology, you're, you know, the, the, the titans in some cases are divine beings, in other, other cases they're giants and the offspring of the first generation. And, you know, scholars of Greek religion have noted that they're actually two separate and distinct traditions that sort of get married and merged into one at some point in, in, in Greco-Roman thinking. But the place where they're punished is Tartarus. 
It's a term that comes from Greek material, again, outside the confines of the New Testament. It would have been part of their world. So they're reading this stuff. And again, you know, since I take a very providential view of inspiration, it informs their worldview, and God is fine with including it in the, in the text of the Bible. It doesn't mean those sources are inspired. It just means that they, it, they, they help them articulate what it was that is inspired. So beyond that, I don't really know, you know what we can really conclude safely uh, as far as the book itself and, and, and what it teaches. There are certainly things in Enoch that I don't think are true at all. Um, you know, so I'm not going to baptize the thing and, and say, well, Tertullian was right. You know? <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But I think it's, it's worth reading all of that material because they read it. And they were, they were very well aware of it. And in some cases, it helped them say things that they wanted to say. And, you know, we have, we have the heritage of that.